we live in an era where most of the world's sports owners are locked away in their luxury suites and rarely speak through anything other than carefully worded press releases crafted by someone other than them. It can be hard for us to imagine the relative Wild West that were our sports formative years in the style of owner promoter that filled those same offices. The kind of person who would be as comfortable running a circus or traveling carnival as they would be in a three piece suit. This is what you don't know about baseball's Hall of Famer, Bill Veck. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Matt, and this is Blake. Hello, friends. Also, Jim Nance. My Jim Nance impression. Go ahead. (laughs) Uh, Today, we have a story about perhaps the best promoter in the history of baseball, if not all of professional sports, if not all of everything ever, Bill Vec. Blake, what is your favorite stadium promotion? I know we're in the middle of like minor league baseball, major league baseball season, but like every sport does these things to get people in the stadium. What's your favorite promotion? Yeah, some some teams do it more than others, and some teams have better ideas than others. I would say locally speaking, at least, because that's that's the area where I've attended the most sporting events, major, minor, whatever, is Dog Day at Durham Bull Stadium. That's something that I have yet to go to, but I just love the idea of taking a dog to a baseball game. Now, my dog has a winter coat year round and baseball not played the winter, so he couldn't chill outside for four hours in the sun. But one day, one day, if, it, if, if I have to go borrow someone's dog, not steal, there's a difference. If I just have to like dog sit for a day just to take a dog to a Durham Bulls dog day game, I'm totally going to do it. I hear that. I hear that. Just not bo- not steal. Just no, borrow. No, borrow, borrow with the intent of returning. There's a yeah. See, that's the difference with the, with the intent of returning. I'm going to bring it back. I might not tell you I'm taking it, but I'm going to bring it back. Just kidding. That's a felony. I, that is. <laughs> you do have to inform the person first. <laughs> I think mine, from a business standpoint, like from a fun standpoint, I'm not entirely sure that I know because like I'm old and crotchety about those things. Like when somebody has like a Star Wars night, I'm just like, oh, that's so cool that there's a star. Why? What? Why does this bring people to the stadium? Like, what is the point? Um, the dog things are cool. I love that the so um, I guess for both of us, the closest minor league team is probably the Carolina mudcats uh in terms of of miles away they do this deal in during the school year and it's a promotion but not really because the schools have to pay for it but they do a game at 11 a.m and they call it like education day or whatever so so schools bring their their a honor rolls or their their whatever and they make it a field trip and while you're there watching baseball, there's these people that do these experiments and stuff in between the innings. So, so that part's cool. It is educational, but they're also getting five, 6,000 children in the stadium watching a baseball game with the concessions open. And, you know, I don't know if this is everywhere, but with our school, they, you know, parents just like, I unreal to me how much money parents give their kids to go uh, buy concessions. But they do it and it's cool. So they're making all this money. Plus, the kid goes home if they had a good time. Then at some point they're like, "Can we go to a Mudcats game? Can we go to a Mudcats game? Can we? Can we? Can we?" Like I think that's just genius marketing. Oh, yeah, kids are the ones. If you want to get to a parent, go through the kids Heck because yeah. kids are going to tell you what they want, and that's that's genius. I think the coolest part, um, you're not my, that much younger than me, so this would have worked for you too. The coolest part of my childhood is that we were the we were the group that um, were allowed to be advertised to excessively. 
uh, before they like passed laws trying to do away with that. So like everything was catered to us, like McDonald's and Burger King and baseball and everything. I guess the best basketball, everything, all the ads were for kids. Mm-hmm. And uh, selfishly, I think that's cool. That's the way to um, go. But I get why we don't do it anymore. So I guess, you know, like marketing to kids is, you know, not great all the time. But, you know, we should do it. The Mudcats didn't get the memo. We're going to turn our attention now to Bill Vec. He was born in Chicago on February 9th of 1914. So quite a ways ago. His father was William Vec Sr. And he was a Chicago sports writer who frequently wrote columns. This is my kind of dude frequently wrote columns about how he would run the Cubs differently than they were currently being run. Uh, It's like a a Monday morning quarterback type situation, By all accounts, these weren't like scathing critiques. He wasn't given hot takes. He was just saying, Hey, if you did this, this is what I would do. I think this would work. Like they were kind of more constructive criticism of the team. And William Wrigley Jr., the owner of the Cubs, one day decided to take him up on his offer of being able to run the Cubs and named him team president. Hot takes can get you uh, get you in the business there. Who knew? That's genius. Like, uh, that's just self-promotion. It's like it's like today where you just cold call employers and be like, hey, are you hiring? Hey, are you hiring? Hey, I'm just gonna call, I'm just gonna drop my resume on your desk whenever you get a chance to look at it. Like that's basically what he was doing, and it eventually paid off. Like in in the form of being the president of a major league baseball team. That's crazy, right? The elder Vec is an innovator in his own right. You're gonna see um, Bill Vec Jr. is gonna do this as well. Um, but Vec came about at a time we've talked about this before: gambling in sports. Uh, being an issue. He came about at a time where this was happening heavily. So he did a couple of things. He supported uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who we will come back to later. We've also talked about him in our Negro Leagues epo- episodes as well. But he did support him as baseball's first commissioner in part to try and stop the gambling problem. It was his idea that if we get someone who's a former judge, who has a lot of authority and and friends in high places, we can get a grip on this gambling epidemic. He also is one of the key uh, figures in helping to expose the Black Sox scandal through, uh, through hearing stuff, you know, through players communications with each other and hearing, you know, this guy turned down a deal, this guy turned down a deal. Hey, I got double crossed by that guy in Chicago. He's able to help put pieces together to get the Black Sox scandal exposed interestingly enough he's one of the the forerunners of getting your team exposure on the radio he wanted every cub game on the radio as many as he possibly could get this was a time where people thought if we have our game on the radio no one's gonna show up they're just gonna stay at home and listen to the game on the radio but everybody knows it's better being in the ballpark than it is listening to the game on radio. So he got the team on the radio. He also, at a time where baseball's fans were, uh, one place I described it is like macho tough guys exclusively. He started having women's days at Wrigley Field where any woman got in free Uh, gave away gifts uh, to get women into the ballpark. And he also hired the first woman executive in all of major league baseball. So that's pretty cool. The elder Vec is a forerunner in his, his own right. While his father was the president, Bill Vec jr. Is going to work for the Cubs doing odds and ends grounds crew, selling concessions, selling programs, just kind of doing whatever. Again, it's not, it's not the 2021 version of the Cubs where it's a giant corporation. Any professional teams, a giant corporation with hundreds of employees that, you know, and it's like, you know, bureaucratic, like anything else. This is the 1920s Cubs where you can just, you know, whatever. And there wasn't a lot of money in it, so you probably had to be just about anything if you wanted a job. 
Uh, it's actually Bill Vec's idea to plant ivy on the Wrigley Field wall. That's that's how you know you're at Wrigley Field is when you when you watch it on TV. I've never been there, but when you watch it on TV, you could turn on in the middle of the game and if the, they could black out everything, they could black out jerseys. But as soon as they show the stadium, you're going to know where you are because of that. And that's like and it still lives on today, almost 100 years later. That's what Wrigley Field is known for in my mind. Maybe maybe it's different for people who live there and have gone there. It's something different. But but that's that's what I think of when I think of Wrigley Field. He is first going to own the double-A level Milwaukee Brewers. So not the Brewers we would think of today, but the double-A American Association Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, he did so with, with essentially friends of his father's, uh, former Cubs players, people he would have been around in his time growing up. Uh, but he was the one who is the, the forefront, the kind of the managing partner of the group. He began promoting there. This is interesting to me. So he would start giving things away, which is not unusual for minor league stadiums then or now. But he would give them away with no like announcement, no news, no heads up at all. You would just show up to the ballpark and you would get whatever it was. If it was birds, if it was 10,000 cans, not 10,000, 8,000 cans of beer uh, to one person. Uh, you know, his quote was that if you give a thousand people a can, they'll drink it and uh, turn their attention back to the game. If you give one person 10,000 cans, there's a good chance that 50,000 people show up to talk about it. So he just did things like this. He gave away live animals. He gave away all kinds of crazy stuff. And you never knew what it was going to be because he wanted to drive interest. He wanted people to say, well, what are they giving away today? I got to go find out. Uh, and so just how to get people to a minor league stadium 101. Uh, my favorite version of this is that he would hold morning games so that third shift workers could get off work and go to the ballpark. And when they got there, he'd have them a bowl of cornflakes for free so they could, you know, settle in and watch. Um, just trying to get as many people as he could. I, it's a stroke of genius at an early age. I like it. I like it. I like the third shift worker thing because there's there's nothing better getting off getting off work as the sun's coming up than something to eat. So... That's definitely speaking to my heart is the food aspect of that. It's free breakfast. And it's not, he didn't just have a mind for this stuff, like getting people the business side of it. He's got a good baseball mind too, uh, because the team started winning pennants in the American association. When he was there, his roster strategy was, and this was a time when you could do this in both Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball. The player system was a lot like European soccer. There was no promotion relegation for the teams. But the way contracts work was very similar. So he would buy good players, promising good players from other teams. Then when they fulfilled that promise, he would sell them for more capital, which he would use to buy some more players. So he was making profit while building a solid roster, which we – we see in European soccer where you, you get a stud, you sell him, you get two or three players. One of them hits, you sell him, you get two or three more, you know, and you just kind of build it that way. So he's ahead of his time in that situation too um, on the baseball side. He served in World War II while he owned the Brewers uh, and he lost his right leg while serving as well which he would use for comedic purposes later. Uh, it was from the knee down. He had it amputated uh, and he has a lot of good quotes. At one point he was his wooden leg. He had carved little holes into it so they could be an ashtray and all kinds of stuff like that. Just colorful, colorful man. While, while he owned the brewers, he wanted to buy the Phillies. They were up for sale and he had the money to do so. He had an agreement to do so. And according to him, and this is important uh, because there's a couple of times in this story where things are going to be according to him. And we don't have a lot of corroboration, but according to him, he phoned ahead to Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And this is where we get some of the negatives of old Kennesaw. Um, he was a 
well-known segregationist that did not want the color barrier broken in Major League Baseball. So not only did did uh, Vec tell Landis that he wanted to buy the Phillies and he had an agreement, he also told him that his intent was to fill the Phillies with Negro League players basically immediately. So his story is that he, he phoned that in, told him, got on a plane, flew to Philadelphia. When he landed, Landis and the National League president had facilitated the sale to a different group and basically blocked him out. Vec was, again, according to him, inspired by the fact that Harlem Globetrotters owner Abe Saperstein was one of his partners in Milwaukee, helped him stay afloat uh, while he was fighting World War II. He enjoyed the Globetrotter, Globetrotter model and, and wanted to incorporate that in Major League Baseball. But again, according to him, Kennesaw Mountain Landis wanted nothing to do with it. Thank you, KML, for nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, he did some cool stuff. But that that is sad that that, that was a time in history. But uh, eventually, eventually players got their chances. I'm sure he had, uh, I'm sure he eventually got his way. Maybe, maybe not with the Phillies, but uh, well, I, I just have a feeling that he was, he was potentially one of the first people to break the color barrier if he was already trying to do it. Before before Vet gets his big shot, he also does this thing when he gets back from the war, where he puts this screen in right field of Milwaukee's stadium, and the screen he would manipulate series to series, depending on the team's opponents. So if it was a team that had a lot of left-handed hitters that could pull the ball, he just jacked that screen right on up. If it's a team that is playing small ball, he might get rid of it. Uh, that part, supposedly true. This part is according to Vec. He says that he went so far in one game to manipulate it between innings or between half innings. So the opponent's up, jack the fence up, we're up, take the fence down. Um, and that supposedly that was banned the next day by the American Association. But again, that is according to Vec, not necessarily true. So so are you saying that he basically he basically built an outfield wall that he could raise and lower depending on like who was batting at the time to make home runs harder to hit and stuff? Yep. Just a screen attached to the wall to stop things, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Vec's major league debut would come very soon in night. 19- 1946 well actually first and uh he had to sell the brewers because he came back from world war ii things weren't great in his marriage uh and so he says he had to choose the team or his marriage he chose his marriage he buys a dude ranch in arizona because why not and moves out there with his family but that did not save his marriage uh, and he gets the itch to want to be back in baseball again. And so he leads a group of investors to buy the Cleveland Indians. That sounds like a midlife crisis type scenario where you're just like, lost lost my family, lost my leg, won the war, lost my leg. And then <laughs> you try and save your marriage, doesn't work. And then you're like, you know what? I'm going to go buy something. Go buy something for myself, you know? You know what I'm going to buy, though? Not a truck, not like a, a, a new piece of equipment or, you know, like whatever, whatever we would buy. I don't know what I'm going to buy when I'm 40. We'll find out one day. He buys a freaking baseball team. So Jackie Robinson famously broke the color barrier for all of Major League Baseball. Larry Doby uh, uh, came soon behind. And in 1947, it was Bill Vec who signed Larry Doby to the first contract for an African-American in the American League, breaking that color barrier. It is interesting to note that at no point in that signing and in the lead up and in the announcement, Bill Vec didn't articulate this whole Philadelphia Phillies. We're going to bring in a bunch of Negro League stars idea during that. And so it kind of leads credence to maybe it, it didn't happen. Uh, but 
this did happen. He did sign Larry Doby. The next year, he did sign Satchel Page to become the oldest rookie in Major League Baseball history, and he pitched lights out at the age of 42, with like 6-1 and one with like a two-point-something ERA. Great. Killing it. Um, absolutely killing it. And the interesting story I have is that uh, Larry Doby has this quote, one by one, Indians manager Lou Boudreaux introduced me to each player. All the guys put their hand out, all but three. As soon as he could, Bill Vett got rid of those three. So it's it's not even a situation where he did it. As, this isn't one of his necessarily one of his publicity stunts. This is this dude's on our team. You have a problem with it? You can go play somewhere else. Goodbye. Uh, Bravo, so Bill Vett. Stood by the decision. I love it. He, however, did do his publicity stunts while he was in Cleveland. One particular one is to hire the clown clown. Not yes. The clown. I was going to say crown, but that's wrong. The clown prince of baseball to perform. uh, And this is a guy named Max Patkin. And if you've ever seen Bull Durham, he is uh, called the clown prince of baseball in Bull Durham. And it shows him doing like some of his antics and things that he would do. And this guy, Went around. He was a he was a former major, not major league. He was a former baseball player who would go around and do these comedic acts. He would he would be the first base coach, and he would mimic the other team's first baseman. He would goof off. He would like drink water and then spout it out as a fountain. Uh, in between some innings, he would do this deal where like he would he would take like a a sixty mile an hour lobbed pitch and like get scared of it and try to run away and then like get struck out and all this stuff. It's just just goofy stuff. He did this usually for minor league teams. The Indians hired him for three years to just do it as a pro. Um, to get nice. In. Yeah. Rub people the wrong way, for sure. They were like, this is not – baseball is no fun. Um, baseball people are the worst. Yes. After he signed Larry Doby, Satchel Page, a couple other people, the team did win the pennant in 1948. Lou Boudreaux, the manager aforementioned in the Larry Doby story, was almost traded before the season started because he thought Lou Boudreaux uh, was player manager, by the way. Thought he was old, thought he was not good enough. Rumor got out in the papers, and this was before Sports Talk Radio, but letters to the editor all indicated that the fans were very unhappy with this situation. And so Vec was just like, okay, you, you guys know what? You're right. We're keeping him. Everything's fine turned a public relations nightmare into better attendance that season just by being like, yeah, fans. Yep. You know what? Okay. I'm going to do what you want. We'll see how it works out. And then with the pennant, you know how, you know how some of us, not me or you in particular, but some of us might want to assist our spouses in believing that all the good ideas were their ideas. Oh man. But they keeps him. They win the pennant. In 1949, they decidedly did not win the pennant. And on the day they were eliminated from contention, Bilvac staged a funeral. And he buried the 1948 pennant in the ground. See, that's Which some also carnival. Which people the wrong way. Yeah, that's, that's, some, that's some carny type stuff. You're just, you're just pulling skits at this point. That, but it is pretty funny, though. Like it's, It makes for fun stories. Like I'm imagining the clown the clown prince basically being like what a mascot would do like walking around and kind of breaking up the breaking up the monotony of a slower sport. You kind of have to do something like that. 100%. He got a divorce and I lost a lot of money in it. A lot of money was tied up in the divorce. So he had to sell the Cleveland Indians, but then he came back buying the St. Louis Browns. And they were in the position that you probably think they were in being overshadowed by the St. Louis Cardinals, because why wouldn't you be? Mm -hmm. But they actually had one important important advantage. The ballpark in St. Louis, Sportsman's Park, was owned by the St. Louis Browns, not the Cardinals. So the Cardinals were the tenant. So Vec immediately went to work. Painting, decorating, putting Browns memorabilia everywhere in Sportsman Park so that even during Cardinals games, there's just a bunch of Brown stuff sitting around trying to like get attention, right? Get drag people to the ballpark however you can. 
Uh, he actually signed. <laughs> it's my favorite part. He <laughs> signed Rogers Hornsby and Marty Marion, two Cardinal X stars to be his team's managers. Uh, so he's even like saying, Hey, we got the good Cardinals over here. <laughs> and it is here in St. Louis where we get two of the greatest stunts of Bill Vec's career. The first one is on August 19th, 1951, when he hired Eddie Gadel to come and play for the St. Louis Browns. The interesting thing about this individual is that he stood three foot seven inches tall. This like he was, he was a made little, a member of the team. He was made a member of the team. To ensure that he was made a member of the team, Vec intentionally faxed, or not, I guess fax machines. I don't even, did fax machines exist in 1951? He sent the contract to the league office after it had closed for the day, but had a copy to show the umpire during the game that this dude legally plays for our team. That way the league office couldn't get in the way and say, no, we're not letting you sign this guy. So in the, <laughs> in the bottom of the first, the first batter to come to the plate is our man, Eddie Gadel. I don't, it might be good Dale. Who knows? He wore the number one eighth on the back of his jersey. <laughs> Was that his idea or Vec's idea? I have no idea. Allegedly, Vec told him that if he swung the bat, he would slap him in front of everyone. <laughs> and so, so instead, and so instead, he took to the plate and squatted. Now, the squatting didn't actually change the strike zone. It's supposed to be standing normally from the knees to the letters, but it's also he's three foot seven, so the strike zone is not very big. He walked on four pitches. And then was pinch run for immediately. It's got to be the shortest Major League Baseball player, right? Yes, period. period. Like 100% has to be the shortest person to ever play professional baseball. Did, did this guy even play baseball before this, or was this literally just a carnival stunt? I actually don't know. I don't know. I just know that it happened. I'm going with 100% circus act because uh, not not that three foot seven people can't play baseball that's just that's just something that would fit bill vex profile is just look at me i'm the guy that hired the three foot seven guy to stand at the plate and i and intentionally not swing at anything yeah the assumption is that he read an article by a humorist of the time that was imagining what it would be like to have uh, a little person play baseball and then he decided to, you know, see. And so there we go. See, see and that's a story. That's a story that probably went all over the all over the place and ended up ended up leaving a legacy. So you gotta, you. I mean, it just the innovation of of him and his dad. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, uh, American League President Will Heritage sees the uh, articles about this the next day. He gets the contract the next day. And he goes on record calling it a mockery of the game and voids the contract so that no, no more appearances made by him. But that's okay, because five days later, Vec unleashed his next great idea into the world, and he called it Grandstand Manager's Day. And it is exactly what it sounds like. Fans were given placards with yes or no on them, or whatever. It may have been white or black uh, in one account I read. But they would be asked questions about strategy throughout the game. Should we bunt? Should we steal? Should we whatever? And they would hold up placards, yes or no, and then that would be the decision. The manager of the team, Zach Taylor, sat in a rocking chair, puffing on a pipe the whole game. Just playing into it. Apparently he was a good sport about the whole situation. While the fans called the game for him and they won five to three against the Phillies. That was going to be my next question was they had to win this game, right? Like whether the fans do anything about it or not, like the, I would be inspired if I were a player to just go out there and play really hard for the fans. Right. Like yeah. that, that, that's just what you do. 
Vex quote about the situation is, I have discovered in 20 years of moving around a ballpark that the knowledge of the game is usually inverse proportion to the price of the seats. Hmm. So the cheaper the seats are, the more people know what's going on. Interesting. Which, which can be s- true. I could see that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Anyway, uh, his goal in St. Louis was to push the Cardinals out to do whatever he could to make the Cardinals move away. And he nearly succeeded, not because the Browns were really successful. They never really were while he was there, but these stunts kind of worked. And St. Louis ran into some, or not St. Louis, the Cardinals ran into some financial issues in ownership and the team was put up for sale. Most of the people interested in buying the team were out of town groups. And supposedly the best offer came from an out of town group, but just in time, like 11th hour situation, uh, Augustus Bush of the Anheuser Bush Corporation came in with an offer to keep the team in St. Louis. That's the one that was chosen. Uh, and Vec logically realized two things uh, the quote he get, said is that he he is not going to be able to run gussie bush out of st louis it's not happening and the second thing he realized is that's i'm me self-made owner of the browns and that's augustus bush and that's an entire corporation i'm not winning this so he first sells sportsman park to the cardinals uh to make some cash and starts looking for people. First, he's looking for a place to move the Browns. His first idea, he's had success in Milwaukee. Let's go to Milwaukee. The Brewers are still a AAA team at this point. The problem is, under the territorial rights that Major League Baseball had at the time, the Braves, the Boston Braves, who owned the Brewers franchise at that point, had the rights to that area. So in other words, a major league team could go there, but for the Braves to let that happen, they had to know that they could put their franchise in a place that would be as successful because it's working out for them. I mean, you, you don't, and it's a thing that franchises do. I mean, the leagues do, they don't want to hurt one owner by helping one owner. So um, that didn't work out. The Braves then took advantage of the situation. and would move to Milwaukee themselves three years later. His second idea was to move the team to Baltimore, as we said. Uh, He had a deal in place to sell half of his shares to a group in Baltimore. They would move the team to Baltimore. He would still be the controlling owner, the managing partner of the group. But he needed six votes from his fellow owners for that to succeed, and he only got four. And he realized that the owners just wanted him gone. So he straight up sold the team and all of a sudden everybody voted yes uh, for that to happen. And so he kind of read the tea leaves and slipped into that good night for the second time or third time, depending on how we're looking at it. That's that's interesting. I, I, I applaud him for at least attempting to do all of these things and then finally realizing like, you know what, maybe my time's up and, because a lot of people don't do that, like some owners that we know and that you are fans of, or not fans of the owners, but of the team. They right. just they just don't know when to let it go. You know what I mean? And come congratulations to Bill Vec for knowing that his time was up. Vec's next stop is the one that if you knew him before this, you probably knew him from this uh, stop. His next go around is going to be in Chicago. Now he's going to take advantage going back home. Technically going to take advantage of some drama in the Comiskey family who had been the original owners of the Chicago White Sox, a little bit of familial situations going on. And he uses that to sneak in and get a 54% stake of the Chicago White Sox. Um, So he kind of snuck in. That's how he was able to get back in when the owners clearly didn't like him. And he is going to go about innovating and doing stuff again. 
he immediately stall, installs an exploding scoreboard at Comiskey Park. Uh, and what that means is there are these lights that would go off. There were fireworks attached to it. They would go boom, boom, boom. There were pinwheels that would start spinning if the White Sox hit a home run. That's copied, right? And the Mets have an apple that pops up. Other places have all kinds of stuff that happens. If you go to any minor league park and you see a home run, somebody shooting off fireworks. Starts there with the exploding scoreboard. Um, the White Sox see success as soon as he gets there. 1959, the first pennant in 40 years for the White Sox happens in Vec's first season there. He also makes this innovation that's going to seem normal to all of us, but isn't. He put names on the backs of jerseys for the first time. First person to do it. Um, it was immediately copied by the American Football League the next year from when he did it. Now, almost all professional sports teams in almost all leagues do this. There are some holdouts, notable holdouts, especially in baseball. Let's go Yankees. Um, and so, <laughs> just sneaking that in. You know, just got to. You got to say it. Yeah, the White Sox had record attendance of 1.4 and 1.6 million in consecutive seasons early on in Vec's tenure. But Vec can't stay in one place very often. He joins up with former Tiger Hank Greenberg, one of the all-time greats in baseball history. They are part of a group that wants to add an American League team to Los Angeles. That idea would eventually become the Angels. And there's one problem. The territorial rights issue we discussed with St. Louis moving to Baltimore. The Dodgers have a team in L.A. They have the rights to say to veto any new team. And Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley is looking around saying, you're going to put that dude in my city. No, thank you. He doesn't want to compete with Bill Vec. So he vetoes the idea of him being the owner. And so that doesn't come to fruition, but obviously the team does come into existence. He does have health problems in 1961 that caused him to sell the team. He doesn't go far from baseball at that point. He tries to buy the Washington senators when his health gets better, but that doesn't work out for him. He becomes the manager of Suffolk Downs horse racing track. One interesting thing in his time away from baseball, it lasts almost 15 years where he's not involved. He gets involved in a really big way. He is the only owner, former or present at the time, who testifies on behalf of Kurt Flood in the famous 1970 antitrust case against baseball that led to free agency existing. So essentially Kurt Flood was traded, decided that that should have voided his contract, sues for free agency on antitrust exemption. A lot of stuff happens. Free agency becomes a thing because of that. And he's on, again, innovating. He's the one saying, yeah, players totally should be free to choose where they want to work and not being able to is violating their trade. Crazy. Good for him. The only one. Yeah, I can't, can, like, could you just think about, a uh, think about how much longer it would have taken. Or if he did, if, if that prominent of a figure didn't testify on behalf of that, of him in that trial, just imagine how long it would have taken for, for free agency yeah. to come about. But like today, you couldn't imagine. You can't imagine somebody not going through the free agency process. Like that that's right. that's that's very iconic in American sports. I, I use the word right. iconic again, but it is it is such a staple in American sports that you can't really think of a you can't really think of American sports without free agency. But he would be back soon enough in nineteen seventy five. He buys the White Sox again for his second go around. Immediately, him and his general manager go to the winter meetings in 1975 and start making trades in the hotel lobby. Not in people's rooms, not in the conference room, not out at dinner. They just set up a phone line in the lobby and start conducting business in front of everyone. And it immediately makes everyone uncomfortable again. Like he, day one on the job, let's mess stuff up. I, it's great and I love it. He's he's so against the grain. Like he just just didn't care. He just didn't care what other people thought, and and he was going to do things the way that he thought they should be done. And a, he won pennants multiple places very quickly once he got there. Like he didn't spend a whole lot of time in very many places. But while he was there, he made an impact not only on fan attendance 
and and stuff like that. But on the field, like you said, baseball decisions, that's all he's ever known because he was he was working at he was working at baseball parks and for his dad and stuff for his entire life. So baseball is really all he knows. So it's natural that he comes back. Here's another thing. So he planted the ivy at Wrigley Field. Here's another thing that happened first for the White Sox. Didn't know this. Did kind of know this, but didn't know this specifically. So the Cubs famous announcer, Harry Carey, always saying the seventh inning stretch. And it's a tradition they still do where people come in and, and lead the seventh inning stretch. That actually started with the White Sox when Carey worked for them. And it actually started because Bill Vec said, hey, I want you to start singing the seventh inning stretch. Sing, take me out to the ball game every night. Harry Carey was like, I I don't think I want to do that. And he said, oh, that's great. I've got a recording here of you doing it. So we're just going to play that. It, your choice. And he started doing it. And it became one of the most lovable traditions in the history of baseball. Bill Vec's idea. You, we need those kinds of people because so, like sports people take sports so seriously. Yeah. You, you gotta, bre- you gotta break it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, if you didn't know the little person story, but you knew Bill Vec, it is likely that you knew this next piece here. One of his last stunts in 1979 is disco demolition night. At the White Sox. This is a product of your typical culture war stuff. In the late 70s, disco had become very popular, just kind of out of nowhere. Popular form of music had upstaged rock and, and pop as not even pop, just upstaged rock as the popular form of music. And that didn't sit well with a lot of people, right? Rock has it had and still has. And it's it's uh, people who are their champions of rock music. And so this led to people who didn't like the new stuff kind of vilifying the new stuff. A lot of a lot of just, you know, we don't need to get into it, but a lot of negative things said about disco music in terms of the quality of music may be true. Uh, but it led to this event. The team's going to partner with anti-disco shock jock Steve Dahl from a local Chicago radio station, 97.9. He had worked at a different radio station and was fired as part of a format change from rock to disco. And so at the new place, he was like just this anti-disco kind of crazy guy. Here was the deal. There was going to be a double header in between games of the double header, uh, or actually first, if you brought a disco record to the ballpark, your ticket was only 98 cents to get in after the radio station, 97.9. That record should be a disco record that you wanted to see destroyed. The idea is between games of the doubleheader, we're going to load them all in this crate. We're going to rig it with explosives. We're going to blow it up because it's the biggest anti-disco rally in the world. The team expected about 20,000 people, which would be a larger than normal attendance for a, a mid midweek game. They got 50,000. Standing room only type situations. They expected people to give their records up in orderly fashion, but plenty of people snuck into the game. And so some records didn't make it into the crate and instead were being frisbeed around the stadium. (laughs) After, after the first game ended, doll comes out, does his shtick, everything comes out in a Jeep, a Jeep, He's wearing army fatigues. It's this big to do. It is the most carny thing of all carny things. And he goes out and they explode the records, right? And then, for whatever reason, people decide to invade the field and they have a big old party. Like records are, are of them, like some of the records that didn't get destroyed, they just like take them and start smashing them and like dancing around in circles. Uh, they just go crazy on the field and it takes the Chicago police showing up with riot gear to calm the situation down. Bill Vec, once it's calmed down, initially wants to continue with the second game of the doubleheader. However, the grounds crew, not the grounds crew, the umpires by that point control the game. So they go out on the field and they start looking around and they see that the center field has been destroyed by an explosion and all these other people have torn up 
other parts of the the playing surface and so they're like mm, no we're done uh initially the game was postponed but then they just said you forfeit this was your fault you screwed it up you lose and no yep. so it's such a such a funny like it's like it's like his ideas just keep getting keep going farther and farther and farther and then eventually this one actually hurts his team you know yeah. the 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 three foot seven gentleman is 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 funny and 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 entertaining and then the clown is funny and entertaining to break up baseball and then of course you got a double hitter and you want people to stay for both so you throw a party in between to keep people there and then three times as many people come as normal and then it just gets ruined by happenstance i it i still think that was a great idea it was just poorly executed his son mike veck uh, was the originator of the idea. So this is actually not a Bill Vack original. It's it's with his son. And he is the owner of the Charleston River Dogs, or at least was in 2014. And they staged a similar event for Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber records. So Like actual records in 2014? Well, CDs. I call them records there because, yeah, but, you know, I don't do, do people People didn't even buy CDs in 14. I'm sure it was like. Probably not. They had to find the one CD store in the whole town and like bring them to the stadium and blow them up. Um, that would be his last big stunt. His last stunt is going to be that in 1970 or 1980, he is going to hire Mini Minoso. Minoso had been Major League Baseball's first black Cuban player. And Vec had hired him previously in 1976. In 1976, he played two games. He went 0 for 8. But he was able to say that he had played in three decades of Major League Baseball. And so then in 1980, Vec hired him again to go 0 for 2. So he could say he played in four decades of Major League Baseball. Um, That would be his last stunt he did build rosters in Chicago, his second go around once free agency had existed. Again, an eye for baseball decision making. This it realized that there was this inefficiency, money ball, you know, type thing we're in that world where we're about market inefficiencies. Realized that teams didn't want to pick up options of their players. And so he would trade for players in their option years and let them play in Chicago, kind of a rent a player situation, knowing that he wasn't going to be able to sign them the next year. That had some success. He won 90 games one year doing that, but eventually realized he started looking around in the eighties. We talked about this on the the Disney podcast we did, you know, in the eighties and nineties, it starts to be what it is now. Big corporations, big money, people, lots of money involved. He's looking around his hall of fame plaque actually indicates, or, or one of his hall of fame articles actually indicates he's the last person of like independent wealth to be a major league baseball owner. And so he's looking around in 1981 and he realizes he cannot compete anymore. And so he sells the team to Jerry Reinsdorf. If you've watched the last dance or were alive in the nineties, you are aware of Jerry Reinsdorf in 1981. He immediately changed his affiliation back to the Cubs because Reinsdorf badmouthed the Vec era of Chicago White Sox uh, plays. Oh, one more thing, because this will bring up why he would badmouth them. I forgot the White Sox played in shorts in that second go around. These were the famous short. See, they only played three games in them, but he uh, brought shorts to Major League Baseball for one time. And that's part of why, you know, just those stunts that everybody, you know, it's like, oh, you can't do this. This is bad. I mean, we got owners like Mark Cuban does silly things and, and people look down on him for it for the, you know, the same way. Reinsdorf badmouthed him. And so Vec changed his affiliation back to the Chicago Cubs. He spent his last years, he would die uh, about five years later. He would spend his last years attending Cubs games, usually in the bleachers, right above the Ivy that was his first big idea out there in Chicago. That's fitting. (laughs) Again, congratulations to Bill Vec for like looking around and realizing that his time was up, right? It clearly was. He, He had already lost 
he had already lost one deal, one city to a huge corporate to an American corporation. And he's looking around and he's like the last self-made kind of baseball owner. Like only money made was in baseball. It was, it's not like he Mm -hmm. went out and did all these other things and then just happened to buy a team. So yeah, Vec, I think that is one of the takeaways from Vec is that he did know when to leave, whether it was, (laughs) whether it was a marriage or whether it was uh, a team when it was, when it was, you know, it had gone too far. He was he was able to read the tea leaves and know it's time to go. And that's a skill that, you know, people don't have. And it's a hard thing to do to realize that, that you're, you've are you hit the peak and this is all there is and let's go to the next thing. And the Carney King, right, just could promote anything, get people to show up anywhere in ways that have lasted till today, doing things that are still against the grain, for people today, there are still owners who won't run promotions, who won't give away tickets, who you know believe that, that that's bad for business, even though it gets more people in the stadium, gets them interested, and and gets their allegiance. Which you know, loyalty is more important than just about anything else, uh, especially in sports. I would say, uh, ra- wrapping up my thoughts is is sports should be about the fans. It should not be about the money. It should not it, it should it should all tie back to the fans and the communities and the towns and the cities. And, and we're seeing instances today where ownership is taking over teams and are making decisions purely based on the money aspect to just simply to just make them richer, right? And that is not what sport is. To to paraphrase, I don't think I have the correct, the exact quote, but to paraphrase Pep Guardiola, what is sport without competition, right? Don't, you, you can't simply make decisions in sports purely based on money. Sport is about competition. You're going to make your money. You're going to do it. There's plenty of ways to make money, whether Bill Veck was right, whether the Manchester United owners and, and the Super League teams we're right. They're somewhere in between, right? Like you're going to make money one way or the other, but you have to make it about the fans. You you cannot have sport without fandom. You can't have a team without fandom. What are you going to do when you run all your when you run all your fans away? Your team's not going to exist. You're just you're just not going to have a base. So you have to do it for the fans, and that's who Bill Veg was. He was there to entertain the fans of the teams that he owned, and I can't think of a better. I can't think of a better example of of a fan first owner. Like that that's that's just who he was. He wanted to put on the best show for the fans, get butts in seats, sell tickets, sell concessions and let people have a good time. Like someone who just worked all night overnight. What are you going to do for like he thought of everybody. He gave them free cereal for goodness sakes. Yep. What what a guy. What a guy. Yeah. Some of the things that I didn't even mention is one of his stops, he like ripped the door off the owner's suite. So there was like no door to get in. Anybody could just do it. He responded to letters in the newspaper about the team. He sold for the first time World Series tickets in Cleveland. It used to be that you sold them together. So if you had the first two games, you sold two tickets. If you had the middle three games, you sold them together. He split it up and said, I'm going to sell each game of this World Series, one, two, and three, and sell them separately because I can get three times the number of people in here to watch a World Series games. And you're 100% right. If you cater, if you think about a good fan experience, making it fun for the fans, getting fans' attention, getting them in the building, then you're going to make your money. Um, And there are countless examples of teams and leagues that do it the other way, where they chase money and end up losing what they had with that. So that's what you don't know about Carney King, Bill Vec. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.
Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, please, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, wait. <clears throat> Wrong show. Wrong show. <clears throat>